WROI, WROIFM.com, streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5, and we'll soon have audio and video on RTC Channel 4. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Welcome back. Thank you. Going to go across the council, say good morning to the President, Chief Executive Officer, Woodlawn Hospital, Mr. John Alley. Hey. Good morning. How are you? You know, if I say any better, there'd have to be two of me. Oh, gosh, I don't know. One, one's enough. One's okay. One's enough. One's I, I hear that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know the Board of Trustees were in session for their monthly meeting yesterday. Yes. I had, you know, a fairly quick agenda yesterday. Uh, usually the first few months of the year, not a lot going on as we move more toward budget season and mid-year. It gets a little more uh, more involved and a okay. little more hectic. But uh, yesterday we did have a presentation. Uh, we've had our what's called a patient monitoring system within the hospital, which does you know a lot of the vital sign monitoring of the patients in there. It's about 12 years old. So we've kind of outgrown the software in it. Uh, no longer is being supported. So at this point, we looked at, do we replace the system or can we just upgrade the software? So we went out and looked at some of the quotes to upgrade the system. It's anywhere from five to $700,000 kind of expensive mm -hmm. uh software is about 130 so once we evaluated that uh once we put the new software on there it's like a brand new unit again so it was just prudent we'd go keep the same manufacturer just do that software upgrade probably take about 90 days to get that done um you know the machines still work but at times being 12 year old software it just doesn't like some of the things we ask it to do <laughs> uh, so this will get it brought up to you know state of the art software and hopefully we can get another 10 12 years out of that equipment at that point you know there'll probably be some technology changes where we would make an equipment change but right now we can still use the hardware just do a software upgrade so it's going to save us quite a bit of money by being able to do that the other thing we actually had uh, kind of an update on the 3d mammo it was kind of the big thing we were put in it's operational now and getting nothing but absolute praise from the the folks that's been using it throughput time is so much faster on our old machine we could do one patient about every 45 minutes we're up to now one patient every 30 minutes much better scan much clearer um, you know, the and we're two week backlog now. So usually this time of year it's really slow in the mammo department. I think with this new equipment, new technology, we're seeing a little bit of a backlog. So hopefully we can get that caught up fairly quickly and, and you know, not quite as long a wait. But uh, you know, again, check with your healthcare provider if you haven't had your mammogram, absolutely get one. It can be a lifesaver. We had Molly Hardesty on, on the first federal program last Friday morning talking about that very thing, the three D mammo and <laughs> Just how much that is changing the whole scope of mammography. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's uh, you know, you, it's kind of like going from a, a Volkswagen to a Lamborghini. I guess if you, you're as for a car person, it, the technology and the clarity of this new uh, new system and what it offers is so much better, more advanced than what they had before. It allows radiologists to get a much clearer view, much better view of that of the the density in the breast and early detection. That's the absolute key to this. Mm -hmm early detection if you do have an issue get it taken care of before it develops in something more serious so to me that's the you know the key there whatever the cost of the equipment was if it makes the difference for one person sure it's absolute money well spent and uh, just so glad that we was able to put that in bring that new technology to our area very exciting it's very exciting one of the other things we've been looking at is you know we're constantly seeing reductions in reimbursement from payers as we, we look deeper discounts from insurance companies so one of our jobs is for what i lose in one area where can we kind of look for a, some improvements and there's a program where we can convert our physician offices to what's called rural health clinics so basically it's a different reimbursement mechanism we'll change slightly our operations one of the things that uh, we have to have then in each office is a nurse practitioner which we do in every office except for uh, fulton county medical downtown so we'll be adding a nurse practitioner there but what it does for the for the clinics is actually increases that reimbursement so and i you know, I don't have actual numbers, but we'll just say if we're getting $50 now from a Medicare or Medicaid visit under this new program, we might get $105. So it's just a, a payment mechanism that allows us to increase that cash flow, which in turn allows us to around 
3D mammos, new technology to bring into the hospital. So we have a consultant coming in Thursday and Friday to help us with that application process. It takes about 8 to 14 months from the point we start it to it's completed. It's an extremely invasive procedure uh, when we're looking at, uh, we have to find some of the documents from 1948, which has been fun trying to locate <laughs> some of those. A bit we're of we're still been. looking. Uh, but, it, you know, eventually that will make a, a fairly big difference in our intake of cash. You know, cash flow is the king in any business, and sure. healthcare is no different. So as we're seeing where some of the major insurance companies are saying, well, we want another 1% or 2% discount, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start adding those all up, all of a sudden, you know, we've lost, you know, 1 or $2 million of cash flow because of the additional discounts. And we're kind of at their mercy. Uh, we're not a large system where we can go in and say, no, we're not going to do that. You know, you're going to give us this discount. So we, whatever they kind of give to us, we argue a little bit, but long term we know they're eventually going to win because the alternative is we don't take that insurance which then is a burden for the patient so that we're kind of in a little bit of a corner on that so we're always looking where can we increase our cash flow to be able to put more money back into the business back into the hospital for either upgrades in the building or upgrades in the equipment such as the 3d mammo so hopefully we have that done in the next year or so and start seeing a little bit of benefit coming back is some re increased reimbursement from Medicare and Medicaid. You mentioned the nurse practitioners. We have three in the system right now, John? Oh, let's see. I think we have more than that. I okay. think we, we might be up to four or okay. five. All right. um, you know, that's a, a nice mid-level provider. Some insurances still will not pay if you go to a nurse practitioner. They, they will not pay for that visit. <clears throat> but we're seeing more and more making that conversion because it's hard to find physicians that want to come to rural communities. So as we look at the, what's called the mid-levels or the nurse practitioners, you know, they kind of work under, under a physician. They review their work. Uh, they're required by state statute that, uh, to review, I think it's uh, 5% of their prescribing uh, patients per month. So there is a review of that. And, uh, you know, we've got some excellent nurse practitioners. Yes, some of them have, you know, years and years of experience. And uh, it, it shows they, they do an outstanding job for our community, for our hospital, and for our patients. Also, last Friday, Pat Nicholson was here as well. And so we had a little discussion. We talked about the mammography, but mm -hmm. we also talked about nurse practitioners yes. and the things that they can do and some of the things they can't do. Yeah. But it was very, uh, a very intriguing conversation. So they have uh, a lot of capability. They have a lot of capabilities. Again, there are some restrictions there, some things they just can't do by statute or by their licensing uh, through the state. But for the most part, uh, they can pretty much treat 90 to 95 percent of the patients that present into our clinics. You know, that's within their scope of service to be able to treat those patients. And again, if it's something that they have question on, right across the hall, you know, is, is usually their collaborating physician that they can either go see or give them a phone call and say, hey, I've got this going on. Give me a little bit of advice. So I'm very pleased with the group that we have. They're outstanding individuals, extremely competent, extremely knowledgeable. But more important than that, they're very patient-friendly. Uh, they truly care about their patients. And that's what, to me, is a big difference in the whole process, sure. you know, is the atmosphere that you walk into for your health care. I hear it all the time where, you know, folks have gone to other facilities and say, you know, if I get sick again, can you not transfer me there? <laughs> well, sometimes that's the best place for them. But they said they just don't treat me like we get treated here because we truly do care about the patients. You know, we don't, can't please everybody all the time, but I think for the most part, we do a very good job, the staff, of really caring about that patient, not only as a person, but as their and family and everything else. They're part of our community, and we really need to keep that in mind as we treat those folks that without them, we don't need to be here. Well said. Last thing we finally got into was the financials okay. for January. Um, we had gross revenue about $12.3 million for the month, wrote off about $6.9 million, which is a down to 56%. Oh. So we've been running 61, 62. So we're making... We dropped a little. That's we good. dropped a little bit on those write-offs. And, uh, you know, that's just, I think, we're, we're pushing the insurance companies a little harder than we have in the past. Uh, there's a fine line. I can't go too far in pushing them because then they start, you know, pushing back. But that is nice to see that under that 60%. And our goal is to keep it under 60% for the year. So that gives us, a, you know, operating revenue or money to, to operate off from about $5.5 .5 million. Operating expenses of about 5.2. So we had an operating income for the first time for quite a few months, 354000 And we had some non-operating income, which is some of our affiliations with some of the nursing homes that we work with in the area, 227000 So we actually had a net income for the month of January of 581000 So 
you know, the board says, oh, good start. Keep it up every month. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be a challenge, you know, as we do have some slow Is that months. a typical January, John? It's a little better than normal. Okay. We, we're usually fairly slow in January. And I think a lot of the, this was from the fact of the pushback we've given to some of the insurance companies. We've been a little more aggressive with them late last year. So we're getting a little, excuse me, a little better payment from them Excellent. now than what we had in the past. So okay. as long as we can keep that deductions under 60%, good shape. February is a short month. How does that short month. How does that usually work out? Um, it's a it's a, a different month because it's uh, you know you base most all your projections on thirty or thirty one days. All of a sudden, it's twenty eight. So you got to kind of ratchet things back, and uh, you know you just kind of get started. All of a sudden, it seems like the month's over. So can't really get a handle on this. We were real busy early in the month, dropped off a little bit through the mid, and then past you know, a few days we're picking back up again. So usually I can get a pretty good guess of where we're going to wind up for, for a month. And, uh, you know, right now my best guess, probably a break even for February. Okay. Uh, just, you know, kind of looking at some of the trends we're seeing. We're seeing a little more inpatient work and then less outpatient. And so it's kind of hard to, to blend those two right now. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's fun in healthcare. If you like a challenge, it's every day is different. <laughs> Board of Trustees will be to get in March. Any particular agenda items that might be coming up at that time? Not really. I think again, we're just kind of fine tuning the budget and and what we presented. How close are we uh, for expenses this month for January? We were really close. A little over what we call our employee benefits. We're self funded for our insurance, and like any other business, at the end of the year, we have a you know everybody deductibles and co-pays are all met so they get a lot of things done in november and december and we're seeing some of those uh, bills actually come through in january so we were about three hundred thousand dollars over budget in, in employee benefits for the month but we go back and look it was just a, a lot of activity with folks getting a lot of last minute things you know it's kind of like little tune-ups going in at the end of the year that well i've got let's get this done i've got my deductible and co-pays met so let's get some procedures done I know in the past you and I have talked a little bit about room renovation. Any discussion of that? Still recently? looking for you know to move forward with that. Um, one of the things you know right now is this rural health clinic conversion. That's going to take up a lot of our time. But as I look at that, if I can get that done within the next you know eight, ten, twelve months, and that revenue stream, that's going to pay for my room renovations. You know, I mean, is, is that time. much of sure. a big deal for us? So. You know, I'm going to be a little more patient because now, as I can see that revenue stream, that cash coming in, I know I'm going to have that probably 2020. Uh, and let's look at that point. Now we we definitely don't have to worry about the cash. It's going to be there just from this one program. Now let's get into the room renovations. We're, we're still wanting to track how many, what our average daily census is because what we'd like to do is take four rooms and making them to three make them a slightly larger a little more convenient for the patient definitely more convenient for the family when they come in because right now it's fairly crowded in those rooms because of the uh, uh, ancillary equipment we have in there years ago when the hospital was built you know if you had a cold you was in the hospital for a week and so there wasn't a lot of monitors and stuff in there now if you're in the hospital you're really sick and there's a you know iv drips going on we got monitors that all takes up floor space in that room so make the rooms a little larger Patients are a little more comfortable. Their families definitely go be more comfortable. Staff can move around because right now sometimes we have to ask family to leave the room so the staff can come in and, and treat the patient. And that's just inconvenient to everybody. So we're hoping to be able to take move that down. That would lose some rooms for us. That's the ouchie point. You, you kind of, what's that uh, crystal ball look? Are we going to get to that point where we're going to want those rooms back at some point in the future? So we're kind of doing a two-year trend of what is our average daily census has been. And if we reduce, and we take probably about four rooms out of service, if we would lose those four rooms, at how many times would that put us in what's called diversion, where we don't have a room for a patient? So that gives me a little more data if I wait another year to get a little more information in that, to put into that model and say, we'll be okay if we take four rooms out. You know, only 2% of the time would we be at the point we didn't we wouldn't have a patient room. I can live with that for the convenience of the increased comfort for the patient and families. 2019, two months into it, but it looks like it's going to be a good year for Woodlawn Hospital. I'm hoping it's going to be a good year. You know, we, we start every year optimistic, and then we always, you know, get the summer blues, so to speak. And, you know, and you start going, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then the fall, we kind of pick up again. So we're hoping to keep steady for the whole year. It's easier from, you know, a management perspective if you kind of, it's not wild swings like we saw last year. And we had some fairly, you know, dramatic ups and downs last year with full house, full house, then absolutely nobody inpatient for several weeks. It's hard to plan. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to send staff home 
but you can't afford just to have them in there with absolutely no patients in the building. So for us, it would be nice if we could just say, let's just keep a steady flow. Uh, staff keeps busy. I'm not having to send people home, you know, what we call low census, where they go home without pay or we're not paying overtime because we're having to, you know, bring them in extra shifts when we're busy. So it would be nice if I could do that. Unfortunately, we're in health care, and it's, uh, every day's an adventure. Well, the world of health insurance, too, is kind of straight, straight down and stabilized itself, hasn't it's a, it? It's not quite as volatile right. as it was the past couple years, and that's been nice for us because now we can actually plan a little better before we'd get kind of what we thought was going to happen, and then there'd be another change come out of D.C., and, well, that's gone. And then we'd kind of adapt to the new thing, and then that would go away. So, you know, some stability there helps everybody not just us but all hospitals because we have to plan it's you know we tomorrow is the past for us i mean we got to look six seven eight months out that's how our planning process is because unfortunately in healthcare that's how long it takes us to react to major changes because it's not we can just instantly change tooling or change our production we have to kind of go with the flow so the more stable the environment is the easier it is for us to plan it and be prepared for those times John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. As always, we appreciate the visit this morning. I appreciate thanks, you having uh, me. Thanks for keeping the community healthy. That's our job. You, jo- know? you know, I've, I've said all, our job is to put ourselves out of business. And, uh, you know, it's uh, there's times we do a real good job at that that, you know, the, it's, it gets <laughs> well, kind of concerning. Don't go, don't go too fast. Don't go too that. fast, <laughs> right. But, uh, no, I, I'm very proud of the staff we have at the hospital. I think they do an absolute outstanding job. And what the key that I see is they truly care about their patients. And uh, so important. That's the, that's to me is the biggest difference is that when I look and I've had family members in other hospitals I go visit and it's just not the same. And, and of course I'm looking for things there and I go, well, they should have done this and they should have done that. And you just see things that they don't do that. You say, well, we do that. And it's a much larger facility. You would think they'd have the resources to do that. But I think it gets to the point they get so big that, you're just a number to them. You're not a person. Whereas us, you know, you're a person. We want you to come back when you need us. And the only way to do that is make sure that we treat you right when you're there. John Alley, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you.